All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to what I think is episode five of Unbiased America Live. We're here with our regular panel. We got Grant Phillips of uh, We Are Capitalists and the Modern Libertarian, who will also be on the Tom Woods show. You're recording tomorrow. Do you know when that airs, Grant? It records tomorrow at 4:30, and I think it's probably going to air the next day or maybe Saturday. But it'll be this, it'll be soon on the podcast, right? Yeah, on the podcast. All right, great. And we have uh, Kevin Ryan, the purveyor of Unbiased America and Unbiased America's creator, and has really great hair. I don't know where that came from. It just seems to be from last week. It's got even better. I don't know how that's possible without modern medicine. Um, <laughs> we also have Matt Palumbo. Uh, who's the author of two books. Matt, can you tell us your two books again? I forgot what they're called. Uh, I'm surprised you, th you forgot them, but um, it's uh, The Conscience of a Young Conservative and uh, In Defense of Classical Liberalism. I mean, I have a review on the back of your In Defense of Classical Liberalism. Yeah. So I've read it twice. Also, we have our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Steve Horwitz. He's the Charles A. Dana Professor and Chair at the Department of Economics at St. Lawrence University as well as an affiliate scholar at GMU's Mercatus Center. Um, we're here to discuss, well, one of the things to discuss is your new book, um, Hayek's Modern Family, uh, Classical Liberalism and the Evolution of Social Institutions. Um, can you give us just a brief background of the, the premise of your book, uh, Dr. Holowitz? Yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to do is, actually, it's multiple things going on at once, but essentially to sort of ask the question, what would... Uh, a Hayekian slash Austrian slash classical liberal libertarian analysis of the family as a social institution look like. So the book's really in three major parts. The first part uh, of those three is is a is a history of the family that looks at the way in which capitalism and classical liberalism are responsible for the evolution of the family toward what we now think of as the kind of modern love-based affectionate family and that the, the argument is, is that it was capitalism that created the modern family that liberated women from the drudgery of, of, of life before the modern family it was it was essentially capitalism that that along with some other things too but but capitalism most importantly that that generated that 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 uh, uh, transition into the modern family. So that's the first part. It's a kind of history of the family. Next part is a kind of look at the modern family, a look at marriage and divorce from an Austrian perspective. Uh, I have a whole chapter on the free-range kids versus tiger mom type parenting stuff. So that look, again, those, those look at all those issues. And then the last part is sort of the kind of framework for family policy. There's two chapters on parental rights and children's rights and looks and sort of talks about how libertarians might talk about family policy and then the last chapter is on the evolution of marriage certainly talking about same-sex marriage but a little bit of discussion about plural marriage and some other related things as well okay so, so that's so, how do you, so my question is how do you tie in Hayekian and Austrian philosophy into into the, the into the family basically this building block of the family and, and, and how they act incentives and constraints and so on well, I think there's a couple ways. I mean, we've seen one way to do it is sort of the economic approach, the Gary Becker, Chicago School kind of approach. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, Austrian types can, we, we like microeconomics too, and so we can talk about incentives and knowledge, and we can talk about the family as a social institution. We can talk about marriage and sort of how marriage are kind of complementary human capital combinations and people trying to follow those signals in the, in the marriage market. But I think the real thing for me is the idea, one of the core ideas in Hayek is this idea that we have to learn to live in two sorts of worlds at once, that we exist both in these, uh, in these micro intimate orders of the family, of firms, our friends, other kinds of institutions, but also in these more anonymous orders of the marketplace and politics and what he calls the great mm -hmm. society. And what, what Hayek argues is, is our moral instincts, our evolved moral instincts, emerged out of life in small groups and in tribes and so on and so our, our sort of instinct moral instinct is to think in terms of altruism and the people we know and, uh, and and having a common goal for the groups we affiliate with that's how we tend to see the world from this you know evolved perspective but those don't work right those don't work in the world yeah. of the market in the great society and so we're constantly trying to figure out the difference between the two and how to exist in them what families do is help us under learn that, right? That within right. the family we can learn those moral rules and how to navigate those two sorts of rules. And so family becomes a key institution in, in making that happen. Okay, so would I be correct in saying that 
that the libertarians looking at the family as a building block of the market structure and how they respond to the market and how capitalism has changed certain societal roles that per perhaps the conservative put a more moral stance on, 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 on the family? I think that's pretty accurate. Um, you know, one of the things I would say is that that you know the family's a economic building block in the sense that what families do now, of course, is their consumption. That's where we consume things within the household, to be specific. 300, 400, or thousands of years ago, families were about the production end, right? The family was the same thing as the firm, a farm or, a, or, or you know, having a cottage industry or something like that. So families always had an economic role, but what capitalism did is to switch that from it being a unit of, mostly a unit of production to being primarily a unit of consumption. We work for other people. We don't normally work within the family now, at least in, in developed right. countries. Um, aside from econo aside from economics and the economic standpoint of it, how did you uh, work in? And I'm assuming you've worked in. I haven't read your book. It's obviously it's not out. But how did you work in Hayek's conception of knowledge and law into the into the, fa the family aspect as well? Well, I think knowledge from from a couple different perspectives, right? I mean, certainly the idea that uh, people have local and dispersed and uh, tacit con uh, contextual knowledge is important for understanding what any social institution does, right? But if you think in terms of what, how parents, how parents raise kids, right? Certainly, we see that same kind of knowledge at work there. And we think about designing family policies. We face the same kinds of problems that we face with other with economic policy. In in how do policymakers know what the one size fits all solution is that will cover everyone? Whether it's about how parents should interact with their kids or about how married couples should divide up work and home, you know, we were joking before we went on air about boyfriends and girlfriends, right? But those kind of questions, right, are questions every couple does it differently because they each have local knowledge about, about what works and what doesn't, and there's idiosyncratic reasons they do what they do. So once you understand that social institutions are there as processes for people to pursue their own ends, you begin to think in, in, in those kind of Hayekian terms. So simply speaking, that the family is autonomous in and of itself, and it can operate far better than a central authority could. Uh, am, I, am I simplifying that too much? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, you okay. can. It, it. Hillary says it takes a village. I say the village can help, but you can't do without a family. What can't do without families? That's right. right. And one of the other, I think, one of the other themes of this book, right? Some, sometimes the way I, there's two different ways I put it. Sometimes I say what I want to offer is a non-conservative defense of the family, or another mm -hmm. way to think about that is you have on the left people for whom, for whom. The modern family is great. They celebrate the diversity of the modern family and choices people have, but are not comfortable with the it was capitalism that made that possible. Meanwhile, conservatives at least say they love capitalism, but they reject, uh, or at least are very skeptical or concerned about a lot of the features of the modern family. So on either side, you've got this sort of dichotomy where where there's a tension about about the relationship between economic freedom and these social freedoms. What I want to argue is that's not a tension for classical liberals. And historically, they happened together, right? It was right. capitalism that, that opened up those possibilities for more choices for couples, for women. For, to for your kids. prior point, do you think the liberal even understands that it was capitalism that gave rise to the modern family? Do you think they put that together? I, I think they, no, I think they do. In fact, one of the couple of the sources I rely on understand that, at least to some degree. Uh, and one in particular is a wonderful article called Capitalism and Gay Identity that by a well, very famous historian of sexuality talks about exactly this sort of argument, the way in which the transition to wage labor and cities and growth from capitalism made it possible for people to live lives as gays and lesbians. And so at that level, he gets it. Um, but he's also in that same article careful to say, well, this doesn't mean that capitalism is great, of course. there's all that. So, so at some level, they get it. And part of my, I mean, you know, part of my kind of goal as an author here, at least to that element of the book, is to, is to you know, really hammer away at both sides and say, if you really like X, you should really like Y as well. Right. Right? And we'll see oh. if it's successful. Okay, how long have you worked? At, how long did it take you to write the book and do all the research? Well, that's a complicated question. In fact, it's where the acknowledgments for the book start. Um, I've been teaching about the family, a course on the family, for almost 20 years now, since 1996. And the idea for the book is about 10, about 10 years old. And I started writing it in 2007, 2008, when I had a, a year-long leave and I was able to spend 10 weeks uh, away from home, ironically, and away from campus. Um, but then the world fell apart, right? In 2008, 2009, we had the financial crisis and the Great, great Recession and all that. 
And before I wrote about the family, I was a money macro, still am, a money macro guy with a whole book on Austrian macroeconomics. And so what I found was for several years, I kept being pulled away from this book to talk about those other issues. Uh, and finally, in the last couple of years, uh, I, I got back, I got the time back and to finish the book, and it had just sat around too long. It had to get done, and so a few people really kicked me in the ass so that I would finally get it done. Okay, and your book is available for pre-order on Amazon. Um, Amazon yes. Prime members do get a discount of, I think, $26, too. Yeah, it's it's not cheap. There will be an ebook version. I don't know what the price would be for that. Uh, yeah, I don't know the price in the ebook version yet, and my hope is that the book's already getting some buzz, and uh, you know, I'm going to be on the have the feature piece on Cato Policy Report coming up in the fall. So my hope is if a few we get some good sales off the top, I can convince them quickly to get a paperback out at a price that's a little more accessible. Oh, very cool. Okay. Um, moving along, I know some of the guys have some questions about some of your, your pieces that came out recently. Um, Grant, did you, you had some questions uh, uh, for Dr. Horowitz, no? Yeah, I did. Um, and, and this... One in particular it is called Breaking Down the Barriers to How Government Can Improve the Lives of the Poor. I love Mercatus. It's it's really it's one of my favorite. I I actually subscribe to their newsletter, and I don't subscribe to a lot of newsletters. Uh, but in, in this uh, study that you did, it was basically about how um, state and local governments can make it easier for poor people to get out of poverty. And it seems like it's mostly directed at urban poverty. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and for one reason, right? That's I mean, you know, in a study like that, you can't be as comprehensive as you might like to be. So we really tried to focus on on the regu on the regulatory and tax state, right? Not I mean, there's all other kinds of things we can talk about. We talk about rural poverty. I live in a very poor county, for example, r poor rural county. But yeah, this was this focus was certainly on urban kind of poverty, um, though some of those things apply outside urban context too. Right. Okay. So I, I've done I, I've done a lot of writings about race and and how really leftist policies from decades ago have in effect created e economic racial disparity. And it seems like some of these issues that are in the urban areas, like occupational licensing, zoning, um, and high sin taxes, you talk about. And for example, I live in Philly. We have a really high cigarette tax. Yep. Uh, uh, seems to be coming from the left. Uh, and seems to be mostly affecting uh, color like black communities. W would you agree with that insofar as urban goes at least? Yeah, I mean I, certainly when we talk about urban poor, we're talking disproportionately non-white, right? So so I mean you know I, you could write you could tell a similar kind of story here and substitute non-white for poor, right and, and and the story would be pretty much the same. I think you know the decision that Mercatus made was to not emphasize the race angle here just because it, it it causes more you know issues for the audience they want to reach than just talking in terms of, of rich and poor. But you're absolutely right, right that many of those same I mean zoning regulations I mean they exist for to some degree, right because whites wanted to you know zone out uh, uh, zone out blacks after the Civil War, right? So, so I mean, we, you know, and later. So we have, we have those you know, regulations have always served those racial purposes, no doubt, because who's got the power? Uh, but, it, but they don't only do that. It's you know, the folks who are being, for example, I mean, I talk a lot about Uber. At least from what I know, right? I mean, the the Uber drivers, though we have significant immigrants, are also somewhat more white than we see with cab companies to some degree, right? Uh, but the same, and one reason because you've got to have a newer car or so forth, right? So so there's, you know, does do those that have racial impact in the same way? Not clear. So some do, some don't, but you're, yeah, for sure. I mean, those regulations to the degree that, that they're they're harming, their, to the degree that they harm poor folks and they harm poor folks in urban areas, they're probably hitting non-whites disproportionately. Yeah, and I agree with you. And there's a great piece on um, on FEE about how minimum wage started as a eugenics plot uh, to protect uh, white unions from yeah, competitive I, black labor. I, I was a co-author on that. So. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that was a great that was a great article. I love that. I cite it all the time. Um, but what what I want to get at now is from from your research and where these policies come from, like occupational licensing, sin taxes, and zoning. They come from the left, and I I, I I don't think they come out of racial spite or or the spite uh, or wanting to hold back poor people or oppress poor people. I think they come out of uh, economic illiteracy, like people just thinking occupational licensing somehow improves quality of the market and protects the consumer. 
is that where it comes from politically, you think? Like, is that the message well, they're trying to sell, or is it more of like a degrowth? Kind of like protect your friends, kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's. I think the licensing stuff is not a left-right issue nearly as much as it's incumbent firms wanting to protect their profits, right? I mean, it's a crony capitalist story. I think is what it really is. And so what you what you know what you have there, the cab companies wanting to block out Uber. You've got the existing plumbers wanting to up the expectations for what you know the 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 licenses and and courses you have to take to be a plumber or hair braider, cosmetologist. So for the it's certainly cloaked in the language of public safety. I mean, it's what, what we call a bootleggers and Baptist story, right? The people who benefit from it and then the, the moralists who see it as a, an opportunity. So again, I don't think it's, it's left-right. In fact, I think you actually see conservatives supporting some of these kind of things to the extent that they don't understand the difference between pro-business and pro-market. Oftentimes they will Conservatives will support regulations that seem to help business, even if they harm consumers. And I think the syntax stuff, to some degree, right? Alcohol and cigarette tax is not just a liberal issue, right? I think it's I think you see conservatives. Right. Too. So it's a, it's, a, it's a political institution issue, in other words. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's bootleggers, Baptist, crony capitalism, whatever you want to call it. The Chamber of Commerce is built on that. That's it. There you go. Exactly. All right. And my and my last question for you is about your uh, op-ed at Market Watch on wanting to join the one percent. And you talk a lot about how, how from year to year, people who are in the one percent, even firms that are in the one percent, aren't always in in that same category the next year, and certainly not within the next ten years. And, and I've I've read some of your stuff on creative destruction. Can you talk a little bit about how creative destruction at the individual level, and not necessarily at the firm level, uh, how that affects the economy and, and economic mobility, and how people perceive that? I'm not sure what you mean by creative destruction at the individual level, unless you're thinking just in terms of of, of you know of like of like investment risks. Oh okay, uh, yeah, yeah. You guess, know what I, I mean? I it's more yeah. I actually think it's more about the choices people make in terms of investment in their human capital, right? That that what you see what you see happen there, to, to you know, is is that uh, people coming coming up with new skills uh, or responding to signals and developing new skills, which in turn enable them to get the jobs that pay well, whereas people whose skills who 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 don't Kind of keep up with where the demand is, see themselves falling behind. So you know, so folks, folks who are getting the social media skills or tech skills or whatever now are doing better, whereas people who have you know skills that were more geared to a 60s or 70s economy are having trouble keeping up. So in that sense, uh, when we think about creative destruction, when we talk about creative destruction, we're usually talking about in terms of innovation and new products uh, that that create new opportunities while destroying other ones. So to the extent that individuals can kind of innovate in their human capital, I guess we can talk about it on the individual level. And that affects uh, mobility and, and well, inequality in the long run in that sense of it. Yeah, to some degree, right? I mean, if you can come up, if you can develop new skills and you can, you can, you can, you know, find where the demand for labor is, you're going to do better, right, than people who, who, who aren't able to do so. All right. Questions, Grant. Do you have another one? Oh, uh, no, that's it. Thank you very much, sir. You're right. welcome. Kevin, fire away, buddy. You're on mute. Murray Rothbard, his infamous yeah. take on parenting and childhood seems to be the extreme in so-called libertarian, libertarian parenting, or at least his version of it, I guess. I mean, he applies many of his economic philosophies to parenting. He envisions a sort of free market where parents can buy and sell their children and children can run away and so forth. And um, I, I read one economist said that Rothbard is allowing the logical elegance of his legal theory to trump any arguments based on the moral reprehensibility of a parent idly watching her six-month-old child slowly starve her to death in its crib. I have a very similar sentence in the book. <laughs> yeah. Are, are, you, are you in the book, are you taking any moral argument against uh, so-called libertarian parenting or are you just basically saying that traditional parenting is simply more effective? Uh, well, I, I deal explicitly with Rothbard's argument, right? The one you're talking about, okay? Uh, and essentially, what Rothbard argues is, is that parent, uh, the way I would frame it is, parents do not have the right to abuse their children, but they can neglect them. So, for example, right? You know, you can allow the six. You can allow. You, there's no oblig. Rothbard argues there's no obligation on parents to feed their children, but parents, of course, you know, can't light them on fire or something. Right. So, so that that's the argument that Murray makes, and I, I think that argument's wrong, and I think it's wrong because what he and I think that quote you read gets at it. He's he is he is being 
ruthlessly consistent with what he perceives his own principles to be. Uh, and what it overlooks, I think, is the fact that when people bring children into the world, uh, that they engage in activities that uh, create an obligation to care for those children. It's most obvious when you think about adoption, actually, right? Because when you, act, when you adopt a child, you sign legal papers that say, you know, this, this is now our child. I am acquiring the parental rights over this child. And with those parental rights come responsibility. In agreeing to parent this child, in the case of adoption, you're taking that. It's very express, explicit consent right there, I think. Well, what about the old-fashioned way, right? Well, okay, so you, you know, you, you, you're with someone, they're pregnant, you, you want to go to the hospital, let's say, have a baby, you're going to keep the child, right? You take the child home from the hospital. So what have you done? You've engaged in the act of creating the kid in the first place. You've presumably nurtured it for nine months. You've taken care to make sure the birth process happens well, and then you've taken the affirmative step to take the kid home from the hospital. Now, arguably, at no point did you ever sign a contract that says, I explicitly consent to care for this child. But this is as close to explicit consent as you're going to get, right? You've taken all of these steps that indicate your willingness to care for this child. And in so doing, you're saying to the rest of us, I'm taking on the responsibility for, for caring for this child. And so what I argue in, essentially in the, in the ninth chapter of the book is that, that once you recognize that idea, and that not all ex consent is explicit, express consent, that even in contracts and other kinds of things, we recognize gradations of consent. My friend Tom Bell, a, a legal prof law professor at Chapman, has written a wonderful article on this, and he's a hardcore libertarian, let me know. Um, and so I'm using Tom's argument to argue that, that that's what imposes the obligation on parents. So Rothbard says you can't, you know, there's no positive rights. You can't force someone to feed their kid. And I'm saying no one's forcing you. You take it on when you, when you, bring the, when you do all those things in the way, in the way that you do that. Okay, so so I think so. If you want to call that a moral argument, you know you can. Uh, I think it's a legal argument, or at least a political argument, about how parents obtain or how parents take on the obligation to care for their kids. And you've also no, written. Actually, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, Kevin. continue. I'm just going to say. I mean, I think I think we do have a moral obligation to care for our children, right? Human infants are fairly. If it, well, it's fairly unique doesn't make sense, but but are fairly distinct anyway in their uh, in 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 the way in which they are completely helpless for a long period of time. Somebody has to care for them, and so we need a way of figuring out who that is. Uh, and the and the choices that parents make along the way are what are what indicate their their willingness to take the rights of parenthood, and with that come the responsibilities of parenthood. Now I should add go part of your other question. I'm more sympathetic to Murray's argument. That that you know parental rights and, and we all you know people like to say oh you're talking about buying and selling children well, in some sense that's true of course what you're really doing is deciding who has the parental rights because an adoption is is a is a swapping of the parental rights if I sell you a pen right what what we're really doing is trading who has the property rights over the pen the pen could be sitting here in my desk but could still belong to you. It's not the physical possession of the pen. It's not the object itself that matters, but the rights claims over it. And when we talk about kids, that's what we're talking about here. So the notion that if parents want to give up their kids for adoption, that we ought to you know, have some kind of market in that, that's perfectly fine with me. It's actually a good thing as we see more unwanted kids finding better homes. We have, you know, to use the language of economics, we have a more efficient allocation process if we did. So, so I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm not okay with Rothbard's argument that you can neglect your kids, obviously. You can hear that I, I get a little excited about this one. <laughs> well, and you mentioned actually in, a, in an article you wrote for FEE about your book that um, parenting styles typically go from authoritar authoritarian to neglect. Yeah. And that libertarians tend to um, err on the side, not of neglect, which they reject, but of more of a passive parenting. Yeah. Whereas you believe, based on um, psychological studies and so forth, that Parenting uh, is best um, best occurred at more of an not authoritarian, but a, a step below it. Right, authoritative is the word. Authoritative that's... is the word you used, right? And and uh, I, it's a bit of a departure from what you normally hear from libertarians. But I thought it was kind of refreshing to hear some sort of a, pr a pragmatic. Uh, well, you know, and I think thanks. And I think part of it is is that libertarians start writing about these issues, engaging in a kind of you know a priori argument that says, well, because freedom's good here, it must be good 
over here, right? And that ignores the Hayek point that we were talking about earlier, this two, two worlds idea, right? You know, we, we, we don't think that when, if you work for a firm, right, we don't think you should go into work and first thing in the morning and say, I think I'll, you know, if you go work at a grocery store, I think I'll work in produce today. Tomorrow I think I'll work in dairy. I mean, you, you're denied that, quote, freedom by the nature of the relationship you have with the firm. Well, in families too, right? I mean, you know, just, just because th there's a difference between the kind of freedom we allow in the great society and because it works and the kinds of rights and, and, and limits that people have within organizations such as the family or firm. So that's why I think one mistake libertarians make is that. But the other mistake they make is that li there's too many damn economists and political philosophers and not enough psychologists and sociologists and education theorists who actually know something about the empirical literature in those disciplines and know what what sort of parenting styles actually work. What, it's not that what we want to do, it seems to me, is parent in ways that raise children that will love liberty. That's not the same thing as parenting like a libertarian. Uh, just, to, just to interject yeah. for a second, Hayek, when he wrote on the law, he wrote a lot about that these laws were born out of not necessarily just logic but experience. Right? I mean, he wrote that these were, uh, over many years of people uh, working together, it was like the evolution of law. Yep. Wouldn't he, he would apply the same kind of verity to a family structure that we already know, or we have an idea of what works. Um, it's using its uh, application and letting it grow from there. I mean, just, you know, within that, within, within that framework. Is that a I correct mean, assessment? You know, to some degree, right, families as a social institution, not individual families. Right. right? institution of the family is a spontaneous order, right? It, it has emerged and evolved over time. Um, and and as, as the sort of context in which it, with it operates has changed, as economic factors have changed, as political factors have changed, the family's changed in response too. And certainly we've lived now, you know, what, a month ago today, right? Uh, we saw a major court decision that, that, that recognized the, the bottom-up nature of that of that change. So so yeah, I mean I think in that sense Hayek's thinking about the law is 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 important. Here. But the other thing about Hayek thinking about the law, right, is that Hayek understood the importance of rules. That humans are rule-following animals. That a free society is a rule-driven, rule-governed, and rule-bound society. And so one of the things that parents and families have to do is help children understand the what the rules are, how they differ in different contexts, why. Obeying the rules is a good idea, at least obeying, you know, legit rules is a good idea. And and that is a different vibe there than the sort of, you know, sometimes what you see by libertarians saying, no, no, you know, let, let kids do whatever they want. Right? I mean, again, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But that notion of, of how how parents can teach children and lead by example uh, in terms of what, what, do, what are the relevant social rules and why are they important to follow, that seems to me a key bit of, of parenting to create adults who can handle freedom. Right. Now, Kevin, do you have another more questions? I, I have one more. Um, this is about a different uh, article you wrote ca called Left-Wing Nostalgia. Am I getting some feedback there? Yeah. I got gotcha. you. All right. Left-Wing Nostalgia for the Economy of the 1950s. Um, why don't you come back to me because I'm getting a lot of feedback there. Okay. We'll come, I'll come back to you right after Maddie. Uh, Manny, go ahead. Yeah, so I noticed you had a, a study out recently on, a, I guess you're talking about a income mobility among uh, generations, and I actually haven't had the chance to read the study yet because it's, it recently came out, but is this in the study or do you know anything about, um, I guess, is there any correlation between economic freedom and uh, mobility between, uh, I guess, someone during their life cycle or, or over generations? Um, so I've seen, you know, I've seen some leftists try to go as far as to argue, well, you know, in countries like Sweden, there's a safety net, so maybe people will actually be more likely to take risks. There's a lot of that to fall back on. Uh, I don't think the evidence supports that, but uh, you know, what is the data on mobility uh, country, on a country by country basis? Yeah, you know, I don't know the international num numbers really well. I know that the Canadian numbers look very similar to the U.S. And to the extent I do know the international numbers, there's a pretty good debate out there, and and and. You know, some data seem to show that other countries have it's easy, somewhat easier for people to move up a quintile, right, from the lowest 20 percent to the next 20 percent. Some data show it's the other way. But one of the things to remember, of course, is that the richer a country is, the bigger each of those units are, right? The bigger those quintiles are, and therefore the harder it is to jump out. So if you measure mobility only by could you go from the lowest quintile to the next quintile up, 
even in our, even in the United States, it gets harder over time as we grow, mm -hmm. as we get wealthier, and we'll assume here that economic freedom is correlated with increased wealth, which we know it is, right? But as we get wealthier, it's not surprising we've seen mobility go down a little bit, even in the United States, right? Because it just gets harder to leap out. What we really right. want to know is what's the absolute income change that people are experiencing, and on that, the data looks a little different. Looks a little like the U.S. is a little better. I guess the other thing I'd say is. People, particularly progressives, overstate the differences between the U.S. economy and the like the Scandinavian ones. It's true they have a larger welfare state, but in other ways, those economies are much freer. They're in many ways much less regulated. Many of them have better, more free trade than we do. Uh, there's less obnoxious business regulation. So again, you got to really dig dig deep and be careful. It's hard to make sweeping statements. Yeah, I know in the case of, uh, actually, I think most of the Scandinavian countries, if you look at uh, Fraser and uh, Heritage's numbers on economic freedom, they rank ahead of us. And uh, I guess in terms of, yeah, so and I, we were talking about this uh, before the show, in terms of mobility, uh, Sweden, you know, it looks like, you know, people born in the bottom 20% there move to the middle or the next bracket up at a higher rate than Americans. But I think, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I believe to go from the bottom to the next up, it takes something like five grand in Sweden. But in America, I think it took something like 11 grand. Yeah, right. So it's just, you know, it's not the same amount of dollars to move up. And I think the other thing to keep in mind here, too, which I do discuss in that paper, is that all the talk about income is potentially problematic because what we really care about is consumption, right? right? What we care about is what are people able to buy and what do they have in their homes? And by those measures, you know, the U.S. looks really good compared to other countries. Uh, and we see the progress of the poor in the United States, you know, more dramatically, significantly, right, when we think in terms of what they can keep in houses. The average poor American, below the average American below the poverty line in the last decade is more likely to have common, you know, appliances and stuff in their house than the average American family period did in the 1970s. Right. So that's one way to think about it. The poor today are richer than the average American was in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, ha I read uh, the other day that something like half of the world's uh, top one percent, when you adjust for purchasing power, lives in the United States. So there's that too. Yeah, that could that I, yeah. that might well be true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to interject, uh, Matt. You were talking about the Scandinavian social safety net. Yeah. So a while ago, I did a piece on Bernie Sanders and about why we shouldn't be like Scandinavia. And oh. some of the research that I found shows that while cu countries in Scandinavia they have a higher gross public spending per capita. But if you fact in the U.S. is like two thousand dollars below them. But if you factor in private spending towards the similar social safety net, kind of the private version of it, we jump way ahead of them. We oh, jump awesome. like a thousand dollars ahead of them, or something like that. Okay. So it, I mean, it's one of those things where it depends on how you how you measure it. Yeah. yeah, and of course, the United States is the most charitable country in the world too, right? When we look at our our, our you know our third sector, right? We look at at charities and voluntary organizations, the people donating their time. We're, we're remarkable and much better than Europe. In those yeah. yeah. Uh, Kevin, would you you want to ask your question again? Try try it now. You're on you're on mute. Um, yeah, I was going to ask. Oh, yeah, you had an article about left-wing nostalgia for the 1950s in FEE, um, and you said it's progressives that are basically complaining about progress um, toward more efficient resource allocation and expanded choice of workers and uh, cheaper goods for consumers and so forth. Um, and you're saying that it's basically it's the political class that is trying to rein in this new economy that's taking power away from them, if, if I read you correctly. I think that's fairly accurate, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and we're starting to see that, really. You're starting to see um, regulate moves to regulate the Internet, and you're starting to see, you know, they're going uh, trying to block Uber in some yep. cities and so forth. I, I mean, you view it as there are, there are now fewer central points of leverage, is the way you put it. Um, how do you see that battle shaping up? I mean, I, I feel like the Internet is, is just a beast that's going to evolve on its own, but you really see a fight against it now, a fight back by the central powers. To some degree, yeah, I think you do, but, I, you know, a couple, I think the Uber thing is the is the kind of symbol of this, right? It's the, it's the thing to watch. And de Blasio caved, right? Oh. Uber was clever with what they did, but, but, you know, what, 4 million app users in New York City weren't going to be denied. It's that simple. Uh, I was on a radio talk show earlier today out of Portland, Oregon, talking about the Mercatus study where I talked to him about Uber, and the guy there told a similar story that the progressive mayor of Portland basically flat out said, we're not allowing Uber here, right? Oh and and not this year, not next year, right? 
And then, uh, you know, what Uber said was, the hell with you guys, we're coming in, try and stop us. And as they did, and as people started using it and loved it, eventually the mayor backed down and, and sort of negotiated with Uber to set some ground rules for, for so it's there now, right? And I, and I think you, you can, there's the political class will be run over like, like hit by an Uber, right? Will be run over by the, the popularity of these kind of things, Airbnb and all the rest. I, you know, they, there will be little skirmishes here and there, but you can't stop this technology and you can't stop the benefits to consumers. Uh, and, and really what's going to happen is is that your generation in particular, right, you guys, most of you are younger than I am, right, or all of you younger than I am, are going to use this and you're going to take it, it's going to be part of your lives, you're, gonna, you, you're used to growing up in a world where everything's on your phone at your fingertips, there's just no way you're going to be denied that. And I think that, that, that the people fighting back against that often beholden to the unions like Bernie Sanders or to some degree Hillary, right, um, you know, imagine this old world where, where they had leverage over the unions, that gave them leverage over, over the producers, but hey, Uber doesn't produce anything, they don't even own any, you know, own any cars, right, so, so there's nothing to grab onto, there's no, you know, and, and that just drives them bonkers, and I think it's a battle they're largely going to lose. So you're optimistic, basically. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> Jeff Tuckerite, I'm a Jeff Tuckerite, yeah. my buddy Jeff, it's, we're not even allowed, like, in the same room together, because there's just so much optimism in the room that, that the walls <laughs> ain't it. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely one of those pessimistic types myself. Um, I have a, I actually have a. The difference is here's the difference, right? There's some libertarians who are like stockpiling, you know, guns and gold for the coming decline. Jeff and I, we're like stocking party materials, right? Because there's going to be this yeah. wonderful party future in front of us, so we got all the hats and you know, and food and and, and alcohol, right? All all lined up. <laughs> Well, I'll bring the I'll bring the guns and gold to your party. You can, I, got, you I can have three guns for a party. Well, you can well you can guard the door. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a rather in depth question. I, I, we don't have time to go over all the uh, methodological stuff, but Austrian was born out of the marginalist revolution in 1871. I think Menger came out with his book at that time, Principles of Economics. Um, and him, it was him, Jevons, and Valras that were really uh, working the marginalist revolution. And at the time, there was a little bit of a problem. I think between Menger and Valras specifically, because Valras had a little bit of a mathematical framework. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong for measuring utility, so to speak. It, it, it's not as in depth as Marshall would have taken it per se, but it was a movement towards you know sort of this inductive process, this mathematical process in in, in economic methodology. And Menger was staunchly opposed to it, um, from what I've learned. It come along 1890. You get principles of economics from Marshall. He introduces calculus into the methodology. Uh, economic methodology and you get neoclassical economics and that's largely what's taught in universities today is uh, neoclassical economics, graphs, math, um, using deductive and inductive uh, uh, methods to to economics. How, how am I doing so far? I, I, it's pretty good. I, okay. I can come up with some details but you got the general, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm general being plots, as brief, right? I'm being yeah. as briefly, going as briefly yeah. as I can. Yeah. Um, moving to Mises, Mises is a uh, Brilliant economist, his book Socialism, I mean, you know, went after the fact that not only is socialism a bad idea, it's impossible. And I totally agree with him, nails it. But the thing with Mises, and I want to know where Mises and Hayek are separate here, is that a lot of people that follow Mises fall into the Rothbardian camp and they're staunchly against using any sort of neoclassical methods in, in, in their economic methodology. And you can correct me if I'm wrong here, I know I get a lot, I get a lot of flack from this on social media, for people that are just so against, like Mises was against mathematics, Rothbard certainly was against mathematics, but I don't see the same from Hayek. And, my, and I've searched far and wide to find information on Hayek and his methodology, and I never saw him say anything that would, that would definitively repudiate the neoclassical method. And that it, you can't reconcile it with Austria. All right, so let's 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 step back from this. Okay. All these attempts to drive a wedge between Mises and Hayek are tremendously misguided and mm -hmm. and and just intellectually and historically highly problematic. It, it, the only way you can understand Austrian economics in the 20th century is as the Mises Hayek, Mises Hayek, okay. Hayek tradition. I mean, I'm, I'm not yelling at you. Will. I'm yelling at. No, no, it's it's my question. Yeah. It's a it's a question. I want to get it out yeah. there. I understand. Yeah. And, I, yeah, and I think it's this attempt to say, you know, Mises was this and Hayek was that, and Mises was better, which is usually the way the arguments. Made. Right. It just it just it, it it gets the history wrong. It gets the theory wrong. It gets the methodology wrong. The best way to think about Hayek is 
Mises, the relationship between Mises and Hayek is something like the following. Uh, you know, uh, me, Hayek was trying to build on Mises' work. He did some things a little bit differently, but all the important questions that Hayek addressed were the questions Mises raised. The best way to understand Hayek is through the lens of Mises, and the best way to understand Mises is through the lens of Hayek. Well, and once yeah, you start... You know, well, his book Socialism had a huge impact on Hayek in as well, much as his yeah. price structure and spontaneous order and, and, and how prices send signals and knowledge. And Hayek had some quibbles with it, right? And, right. And it was, right. And it was Hayek, right, who wrote in, in, in the, in the Counter-Revolution of Science, right, this great footnote about subjectivism where he mm -hmm. says this has been most developed in the work of Mises. And Mises mm -hmm. said good things about Hayek the rest of his life. So, you know, it, there, there wasn't much of a, a difference here. And, and Hayek, you know, Hayek didn't make much use of mathematics uh, in his work. Um, did he ever come out and sort of, you know, roundly criticize neoclassical economics for it? No. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that, you know, Hayek was working within the discipline in a way that Mises wasn't, at least when Mises got to the U.S., right? Mises was in, 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 when he was in Vienna. But when Hayek, Hayek was at the LSE, he was in the middle of these debates with the, with the mainstream. So he, and he understood it. I think what Hayek really happens to Hayek in the 30s is he, he's, he's naive in a sense. He's left confused. He says, I thought I understood what economics was. And I thought everyone else did too. But apparently these guys, meaning Keynes and the market socialists, right? Mm -hmm. right? What they think economics is is not what I thought economics was. I thought we all agreed on what it was. What, what the hell's going on here? And I think that's what leads Hayek, as we were talking a little bit about this before we went on the air, that's what leads Hayek down this broader road later on, trying to figure out how did we get this all wrong. But the, the, the economics the Hayek thought everyone bought, believed was the same economics that Mises had. And Mises wrote in one of his essays in the early 30s, basically, that we're all part of the same tradition, meaning everyone. So they both right. understood it that way. See, and, and I just... You know, yeah, you're it's right. not about yeah. the math. It's not about that other stuff. Right. It's, they, so, there's a very consistent Mises. I mean, if you want me to, you know, it's Mises, Hayek, Kersner. That's mm -hmm. and and yeah. I'm going to say it, and it's going to piss your audience off. Rothbard's the deal. It is. <laughs> okay. um, Rothbard, yeah, so Rothbard, you Rothbard the same way I do. Is a deviation. What Roth? If you want my two cents, right? And yes, and I do. Let me give my usual disclaimer. Okay, I wouldn't be talking to you today. If it wasn't for Murray Rothbard, right? For New Liberty was a profoundly important book in my intellectual development, and it still lays out pretty much the vision of the world I want to get to. Uh, and and so this is not I'm not throwing Rothbard out completely here, but I think what Rothbard did was <laughs> it's Rothbard's an unholy <laughs> pieces and Rand. And, and yes. what you get yes. in Rothbard is this kind of Randian rights deductivist framework that through which he reads Mises. But if you actually go back and read Mises, especially the early Mises, right, before he started listening to what other people were saying about him, I think, but the early Mises, it's not that at all. It's a, it's, it's a very, very different style and argument. And, and Rothbard sort of fuses natural rights into this, and Mises hated natural rights. He was a complete utilitarian. So right. you, you get this whole, I mean, it's Rothbardianism, right, right. Uh, is what it is. We can analyze it on its own grounds, but if you were making a little family tree here, it's the branch that goes off this way. The mainstream of Austrian economics does not go in the Rothbard direction. So in my assessment, it seems that Hayek largely stayed out of that. He took from Mises all the, all the good things about Mises and kind of was never really a Mises disciple. He was more so a Mises thinker. He, 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 yeah, he took the yeah. Good yeah, yeah, he stood standing on the shoulders of giants, right? I right, mean, exactly. Just like you did. Like you mentioned Rothbard, and I'm, you know, I follow Rothbard. I love Rothbard, but I'm not going to take everything that Rothbard said as gospel, right? I mean, and, and, and certainly in some libertarian communities, if you say that, I mean, you're already branded a statist. Right. Um, you yeah, don't you're know a statist. Think. You're right, yeah. right. Well, look, here, here, Will, here's another example of this. I wrote a little blog post about this a number of years ago. But notice, right, how the Mises Hayek divide, which is often the Rothbardians, right? Is turned into a divide between Mises, between uh, the the Hayekian status and the Misesian what? Because Mises was no anarchist, right? But right, exactly. But 
But that's just crap, okay? And it's crap. Hayek, yes. Hayek was no anarchist. But the two things you have to remember, first of all, there's a famous story, and it's true. I know people who were there. When Hayek was in the States in the 19, early 19, late 70s, early 80s, he met with a group of then young Austrian economists, a bunch of names you know who are now big-time guys now, and they would start talking about anarchism, right? And Hayek said something like the following. He said, look, I'm an old man, right? I can't be an anarchist now. I have this understanding of what anarchism is. I can't be an anarchist. He said, but if I were a young man today, I would find this very, very interesting and fascinating, and, you know, that's, that's where I'd be. So that's one. Secondly, you can take Hayek's arguments and push them in an anarchist direction, even if Hayek didn't go there. Right. And the work of a number of my good friends and colleagues out of the sort of George Mason program, this is exactly what they're doing. And, and I would say it describes my own work to some, to some extent, too. Um, so you can be a Hayekian anarchist. All right, right. Um, and 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 the divide is not between statism and it's it's not it's none of that. I mean, it's very it's very very frustrating to me because because I love both Mises and Hayek and I love things about Rothbard and when people start trying to make these divisions and do these things it just it breaks my heart and gets me angry and it gets me waving my hands around. Me too. Me too. Yes, I, I know how that feels and I think to a degree what you described like the Hayekian um, uh, uh, anarchy uh, can be. Can be found in David Friedman's Law's Order, his yeah. understanding of the law and how it's, you know, the spontaneous I mean, law can occur without the state. There's a whole new book out by my by my young colleague Ed Stringham on private governance, right? Mm -hmm. That talks about why we don't need the police, and you know, right. and what Ed's doing there is making Hayekian spontaneous order, emergent right. norm arguments about for like, the case for anything. Pete Leeson has done this in some of his work as well too. I think there's a difference there, and this is probably going to be the last comment until we move on, but it's a co Hayek's more of a cost-benefit scenario, whereas the Rothbardian is more of this dogmatic approach, that it's the moral thing to do. Right, it's right. It's, it's natural rights versus utilitarianism in the broader consequentialism. Absolutely, and now that's a whole different debate. For All right, one last question on this, and it's the Hayek... Friedman divide, which I don't think there was anything they really ever disagreed on, and Hayek even mentions that that there was. I agree with my colleague on mostly everything. That's what he said in public. Said. That's what yes, he said in public, right. not in <laughs> private. <laughs> okay, so but he was really against monetarism, but I think it's misunderstood. Friedman's take on monetarism somewhat misunderstood, because Friedman had said many times that he wasn't a fan of the Federal Reserve, but if there is a Federal Reserve, it should be it should promote a stable currency. Okay, but where I think the divide was was on competing currencies, in which I agree with Hayek on, and I think Friedman today, seeing the, you know, that yeah, was, toward the end of his life, he came around. I yeah, think. but I think Friedman was very concerned about network effects, which at that time may have been a problem, but today with cryptocurrency, it may not be that much of a problem uh, as, as they were then. So I don't see a big divide between the two, really. I don't. Well, I don't see it. I, there's some issues that they divide. I think the divide between the two is is actually a methodological one, right? I mean, yeah. Friedman by the 50s and 60s was committed to kind of you know, aggregate empirical econometric version methodological vision, right? And so you can see why he would care about the quantity, the total quantity of money, right, mm -hmm. in the ways that he did. It's easy to measure, and 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 look, Monetary History of the United States is one of the most important books. Right, the history of economics, right? It's great, but you can see why that made the important. Why Hayek would be not comfortable with that? And I think the other thing, and maybe this is a good place to end this little loop, mm. this little loop of conversation. The most distinctive thing about Austrian economics is its theory of capital, and and the Chicagoans do have a much different and I think much weaker theory of capital that leads them to think in aggregates, that leads them to not see the kinds of questions that are at the core of the Austrian business cycle theory, for example. And when you start to really break it down, uh, that's where the differences are. And I think, by the way, the same is true. Keynesians don't have a, really a theory of capital at all, right? Chicago just has a really bad one. Uh, but the Austrians do, and, and that's that's where the difference is. And go go watch the rap videos, right? And yeah. You can see it, in both of those, this, that, that Austrian theory of capital is right in there. Okay, I see a lot of different, I mean, yeah, we can end there, but we can go on about that all day. Anyway, um, I wanted to get to our segment part. We, yeah. we have a, we're debunking a meme. Um, I'll read it to the audience so they know. There's a meme out by Occupied Democrats, which obviously has some serious problems with economics. But I'll read the quote. It's, for 35 years, Republicans have argued that if we give more wealth to those at the top by cutting taxes, it will trickle down. Yet every time they try that, it explodes the debt and concentrates income even more. 
twice now in the past 20 years as a, de a Democrat president has had to come in and clean up the mess left behind. Um, it's really hard to know where to start on that. Um, yes, I was thinking the same thing. we got to really go phrase hard. by phrase. So I don't know where her starting point is for 35 years. Um, I don't know. I mean, is she talking about... Is she saying... I 1980, guess, she's talking about the beginning of the Reagan administration. She, exactly. So she's gone, yeah, she's gone into the beginning of the Reagan administration where if Volcker was tightening the, the, the money supply there and you had three years of mo monetary contraction and you had, uh, you've had a recession... And then obviously by the end, by I think it was mid or end of 83, it started to take off. Yeah. yeah. And I think ever since then, until about 2006, um, I think some economists have called it the, the, the 25 years, the, the most prosperous 25 years in human history. Yeah, we had a couple of, couple of backward steps, you know, around 9-11 around and around Y2K, and there was in the early 90s, there was a brief... You know, but yeah, I mean, almost, almost uninterrupted growth. But, but you, know, I mean, I can kind of break this down phrase by phrase if you, if you want, right? Because there's a bunch of interesting things going on here. Yeah. So, right, first, first of all, Republicans have argued give more wealth to to those at the top by cutting taxes. All right. First, you know, referee throws a flag. Right. Says, whoa, wait a second. All right. Cutting across the board. If you cut tax rates across the board, you're you're giving. More, first of all, you're not giving more wealth. You're allowing people to keep more of their income, not wealth, by the way, if we want to be really picky. Mm -hmm. all right? um, and, and that the idea that somehow the argument was that we just give benefits to the wealthy and somehow that will trickle down. There's no, no such thing and, and no such argument. And as Tom Sewell said, find an economist who believes this professional economist who believes trickle-down economics. There's no such thing. So that phrase trickle down is a it's like neoliberal. It's 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 a term invented by critics and used to, to So let me be clear, there is no meaning to the term trickle down economics. Can there's we... no right, there's no economic theory that there's no economist who would argue if you make the rich richer by giving them stuff, that that will trickle down and increase <laughs> the wealth of the poor. What get two things get said. If you cut tax rates across the board, people will work harder. That was the supply side argument. They will work harder. They'll generate more income. Even though you've lowered tax rates, you'll generate more tax revenue because lower rates times a bigger base. There's that version, which I think is a valid argument. All right. The other version, of course, is if we're free, <laughs> if we have a free economy, uh, and and uh, some people get wealthy in that economy by serving others, by the way, uh, and accumulate that wealth and save it, that will create the capital for the next generation that will make them wealthier. Now, if you want to call that trickle down, you can, uh, but no one calls it that, and that's been around for 200 years. So this is not like Reagan invented that. Another point, like let's say if I'm a business and I get a tax cut and I go, Gee, you know, I, my costs are a little bit lower, I can hire someone else with the money, I, with the money I'm allowed to keep. That money goes directly into a new employee's hands. I, I don't see it trickling down. Any, it goes directly to somebody. Sure, there's a conduit, but I don't see this cosmic right. agent trickling money down. <laughs> you know? Right. As, yeah. As if the, and, and the trickle, right? As if there's this yeah, trickle. Rich people, and there's this little tiny trickle, right? That comes. No, right. 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 No. So. So. I mean, I think the, you know, those are the ways. That's a problem off the top with this. Okay. I, yeah. I'm I, just gonna I, say the next. Oh, that that explodes the debt. No. What exploded the debt in the Reagan years was the refusal to cut spending, right? Mm -hmm. Revenues were flat, if not higher, right? The debt grew because they couldn't cut, they didn't cut spending. It's not mm -hmm. because of, it's not because of that. And then concentrates income even more. Well, we've talked about that, right? And how it concentrates, it's not, we haven't seen increased concentration of income in any significant degree. Grant, do you have a question about this meme, too? I know yeah, you well, hate it. No, I do, I do hate it. I hate it a lot. I think, um, <laughs> it's I think, easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hillary Clinton said it, and Occupy Democrats posted it, yeah. and they're like anti-corporate welfare and all that stuff, and I'm just like, come on, what What do you think? And they're also, they're anti-war, don't forget that, they're yeah. also yeah. anti-war. Um, but anyways, what I wanted to say about trickle-down is, um, and I've said this to people who say trickle-down economics, I'm like, you realize it's not a real thing. And I, I think they just grasp at straws and don't realize it's a political pejorative. It's just yeah. a but Wikipedia that somebody made up and it sounded good. It's like middle class economics, fair wages, yeah. uh, e you know, equality. E oh God, equality, racism has now been transformed to mean anything. Right. Uh, so it's Not just a, a word that's just been redefined. Yep. It's an 
liberal. Liberal was redefined to cover up socialism. Well, uh, there's actually a new word. Uh, a friend of mine was at a meeting for they were going to drill in this specific area, and every the, the city came out, which is Long Beach, was a very liberal city, and they came out and called the people that wanted to drill, you know, environmental racists. Yep, that's a that there's a whole, I, whole I can't believe that area of study on environmental racism. The idea that you know oh. that, that that polluting companies. <laughs> that's a thing. But, yeah, no. What, what the argument is is that polluters tend to locate in in areas that are predominantly non-white, and so you know, yeah. Trust me, this is a white area, and they're well, throwing that thing around like it's nobody's business. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, well, um, I have a quick comment on the mean, uh, Will. Go ahead. So it seems to be saying that you know Reagan cut taxes, and then Bill Clinton had to come along and rescue everything. Uh, Bill Clinton rose the top marginal tax rate by three percentage points. Yeah. So, like, what's their argument that that if only Reagan well, didn't cut the tax rate by three percent less, everything would have been fine? Yeah, I think. And well, that's the one. That's the one thing that's true in here, by the way. The mm -hmm. one thing that's true in this mean it is true, right? That that Clinton's years in office saw the the deficit decline mm -hmm. dramatically, though the debt didn't, right? Yeah. And we actually had year two of a small surplus, but why did that happen? The well, president doesn't control spending, first of all. Yeah. And the Clinton years, he was blocked by a GOP right. Congress, so yeah. there wasn't that one spending state under control. Yeah. Two, we had a tech, we had the tech boom that helped. Three, we had free trade too. That was a big growth, you know. Just so Clinton was, Clint, Bill Clinton's the luckiest damn guy ever for a whole bunch of reasons. All right, but but no, as a president no. anyway, he's the luckiest. I mean, he's very lucky. He did good things, and in fact, you know, you could make a pretty good argument that that says what the I the from a libertarian perspective, having a Democrat president with a GOP Congress, if if that Congress is has any kind of balls, yeah, I mean, it, God. Is, the best, is the best solution here. Yeah, uh, started on the Congress. And I mean, that, that tech bubble burst right after he left office. It wasn't him leaving Bush with uh, not the best president. Well, that's that's yeah. right, and then right, and then and then uh, you know, uh, not 9/11 on top of it. So right. so yeah, and so that part, I mean, it's true that now. The, the other implication, of course, is that Obama has come up, come in and cleaned up the mess left by Bush. No sale there. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's true. It's true that the deficit is. It's true that the deficit is is down from where it was, but it was only that high because of some things Obama did. Yeah, I, I love the people who say that Obama cut the deficit in half. I mean, what they're saying is, all right, he he cut the deficit in half after tripling it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that's that's another way to look at it, right? Yeah. So, but but I mean, she is right in the sense that the deficits come down under Obama. It's still ridiculously high, and the debt's going up. But to say he somehow cleaned up Bush's mess, yeah, you know that 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 doesn't that doesn't go. And, you know, the last the last implication of it is that is that the housing crisis was somehow uh, at the fault of, well, she doesn't necessarily say this, but of the free market, yeah. of the markets, yeah. and that, that Obama's had to come in and, and re-regulate and so forth, which is one of those things that makes smoke come out my ears. Yeah, yeah. folks should, folks should Google my piece for fee with my friend Pete Becky called The House That Uncle Sam Built, which we wrote shortly, you know, like 2009, and that piece is a nice, very accessible overview of the housing crisis. Kevin, didn't we post, it, we posted that today in Unbiased America, right? Yeah, we did. Okay, okay great. Yeah. Nice. You, you know, can find it on Unbox America. Um, yeah. I want to move on to our next segment, uh, which is the winners and losers of the week. And I'll start with Grant, and I'll go down. I'll go down the list. Grant. Um, yes. <laughs> who are your winners and losers of the week? My loser is Cecil the Lion. <laughs> he was. He was unfortunately uh, the victim of a hunting accident. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. I think the Confederate flag might have been the perpetrator. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, and my my winner is gonna have to be the dentist uh, who shot him. Yeah, well, that, I wanted to, <laughs> but that just seemed too cruel. So too obvious, um, too. yeah, oh, way yeah. too way too obvious. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Donald Trump again because he is just still going. Pe I don't like him. I don't like him at all. But he is pedal to the metal. And I saw a really interesting um, uh, Marco Rubio came out and said. It's not that I agree with Donald Trump. I just like that he's saying whatever the hell he wants, and he doesn't care what people think about it. That's I his love own. that. I love that. That's exactly what I would do if I was in his position. I don't. I think he's in, I, he's wrong about immigration, but um, yeah, he just says whatever he wants. I love it. It will freeze. 
Yeah, why don't you go ahead? What's your winners and losers, man? Uh, actually, I lose this Chris Christie. Uh, honestly, when he took office, I loved the guy. Thought he would. You know, I thought he'd be a, a legitimate conservative, and now uh, he made some pretty idiotic comments about what he's going to do uh, regarding drug legalization once he takes off, or if, if he were to take office, which I think are asinine. Um, my winner of the week is The Onion. They actually have a hilarious piece out. Um, it's an op-ed supposedly by Donald Trump titled, uh, Let's Be Honest, You Want to See How Long This Is Going to Last, Don't You? And it's honestly the funniest thing I've read all week, so everyone should go check that out. Pretty good. Did Kevin, did you go already? Because I got booted here. Uh, no, I didn't, but my winner of the week is the city of Boston, which I love, because they pulled out of the 2024 um, Olympic bid, which was going to be a disaster for Boston, no matter how you cut it. It's usually a disaster for any city, but the mayor refused to, to sign off on this deal that would have put, uh, put the, the public, um, we're going to have to co cover any losses that, that occurred. So they didn't need that. And frankly, Boston, with all due respect to Dr. Horwitz here, is, is Hockey Town USA and doesn't need, <laughs> doesn't need the Olympics to, to, you know, to cement its status as the greatest sports city in, in America. And my loser of the I've week... I've gone too far. <laughs> my loser of the week is Rand Paul because uh, it came out that in the first half of the year, his super PAC raised $3 million versus uh, um, Jeb Bush... His super PAC raised $103 million, and Rand Paul is really slipping. I mean, he's got to he's got to come out during these the, during these um, during these debates and differentiate himself and tell people why he's different than the rest of these people, because so far he's just not getting traction. Okay, I would agree with you on that. I think Rand Paul is going to be fine in these debates. I think it's just the consistency of his message is far better than Jeb Bush. I hate. I just really just can't stand Jeb Bush. And part of the reason is it goes to my my uh, winner of the week, Ted Cruz, for excoriating on the Senate floor Mitch McConnell for adding the Export Import Bank as an amendment to the Highway Bill, which will keep that corporatist uh, uh, New Deal throwback alive, which really bothers me. I can't stand that thing. You want to talk about, you know, uh, helping big corporations. It's horrible. And my loser of the week is Planned Parenthood. I mean, they just, they are just not looking good at this point. It's pretty horrible what they're doing, in my opinion. And um, I think that, I, I don't, obviously because, again, Mitch McConnell will, put, will add this as an amendment to any bill, is defunding Planned Parenthood. It, as a standalone bill, it won't pass. But Rand Paul at least is putting it out there. So I think that's a good thing. And, um... Go ahead, Steve. I was going to say, can I play two when you're done? Yes, you're, oh, you're, you're up next. You're, you're definitely right. playing. Yeah, You're last, so people actually stick around. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> they want to hear you talk. They don't, give a, they don't care about us. Go ahead. Well, my, my winner uh, is libertarians, especially libertarians on social media. And exactly, my, I say that only because Grant actually stole my winner, Donald Trump. Uh, I think that libertarians are going to... Uh, between Trump and Bernie Sanders, and to some degree, and you know, we just we're endless opportunities to make fun of the political class <laughs> over the course of the next bit. My loser, however, is actually Bernie Sanders. I think his stuff on immigration, the comments he made on immigration, and how you know open borders are a Koch brothers thing. Um, I, I, it's put not only is it great for libertarians to go, he, the guy, the guy is a freaking fascist, right? But but I think it's also, really good. Uh, it's a put, it puts progressives in a difficult spot. I think his his own progressive supporters now are in the spot of Do you agree with that? Right? You don't want to help the global poor. You're more concerned about unionized U.S. So I think this is not so great for Bernie, and it may not be so great for the for the for his progressive supporters. But we'll see. I've been I, I've been wrong before. Hey, he's against the Export Import Bank, so. <laughs> You know, yeah. so that's a huge yeah, and, plus. and he's good on some. Don't get me wrong, Bernie's good on some other things, right? But he's yeah. crazy. I mean, he's crazy. Yeah, I don't think there's enough weeks to make Bernie Sanders the loser, though, because there's just so <laughs> many other things. That there's just not enough in the calendar. But yeah, I, I got my Koch brothers check this week to uh, really, really support you know open borders. Yeah, how come I didn't see you at the meeting, Grant? <laughs> yeah, this is a Koch brothers show. Damn it, I missed this week. <laughs> I think we get Dr. Horwitz on here. Koch brothers, thank that's you, funny. Koch brothers. You're very, you're very, very nice. I also have a Koch Brothers pen that I use during the show. It pisses a lot of people off. But anyway, um, show's wrapping up at 6.05. I want to thank everybody for watching. I hope you enjoy the show. Obviously, it'll be archived. Please 
uh, go to Amazon. The book is Hayek's Modern Family. They could find it just by typing that into Amazon. Uh, right, Dr. Horowitz? Absolutely. Just, okay. okay. Um, and you can pre-order for, for Amazon Prime and you get a discount. Also follow We Are Capitalists, great page. Grant writes, grants all Grant stuff is there and on the, on the Modern Libertarian. And again, Grant will be on the Tom Woods Show. We'll let you know next week when that is and we'll post that to his social sites. It'll be, on my, it'll be all over my stuff. Perfect. And Kevin Ryan, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the father of Unbiased America. Um, follow Unbiased America, it's a great page. Matty Palumbo, being classically liberal, obviously, biased books. Myself, the analytical conservative in Unbiased America. And you're and you have a page too, right? You have your own personal page or, or a, a, a yeah, I do. Page. Okay. The best way to get the best way to stay in touch with me is to follow me on Facebook. Uh, okay, I, I'm I'm friended up, but you can certainly follow my personal page, and you can you can also follow my public figure page as well. All right, and thank you so much, and we'll have to have you back. There's just so much more to talk about. Anytime, anytime. Thank you so much again, and good luck with your book and everything else. Thanks, guys. All Take right. Care. Thank you. Uh, classical liberalism and the evolution of social institutions. Um, can you give us just a brief background of the, the premise of your book, uh, Dr. Horowitz? Yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to do is actually it's multiple things going on at once, but essentially to sort of ask the question: What would a, a Hayekian slash Austrian slash classical liberal libertarian analysis of the family as a social institution look like? So the book's really in three major parts. The first part uh, of those three is is a his, is a history of the family that looks at the way in which capitalism and classical liberalism are responsible for the evolution of the family toward what we now think of as the kind of modern love-based affectionate family, and that the, the argument is that it was capitalism that created the modern family that liberated women from the drudgery of of, of life before the modern family. It was it was essentially capitalism that, that along with some other things too, but but capitalism most importantly that that generated that 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 uh, uh, transition into the modern family. So that's the first part. It's a kind of history of the family. Next part is a kind of look at the modern family, a look at marriage and divorce from an Austrian perspective. Uh, I have a whole chapter on the free range kids versus tiger mom type parenting stuff. So that look again those those look at all those issues. And then the last part is sort of the Kind of framework for family policy. There's two chapters on parental rights and children's rights, and looks and sort of talks about how libertarians might talk about family policy. And then the last chapter is on the evolution of marriage, certainly talking about same-sex marriage, but a little bit of discussion about plural marriage and some other related things as well. Okay. So, so that's so the you, So my question is, how do you tie in Hayekian and Austrian philosophy into into the, the into the family, basically this building block of the family and 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 how they act, incentives and constraints, and so on. Well, I think there's a couple ways. I mean, we've seen one way to do it is sort of the economic approach, the Gary Becker, Chicago School kind of approach. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, Austrian types can, we, we like microeconomics too, and so we can talk about incentives and knowledge, and we can talk about the family as a social institution. We can talk about marriage and sort of how marriage are kind of complementary human capital combinations and people trying to follow those signals in the, in the marriage market. But I think the real thing for me is the idea, one of the core ideas in Hayek is this idea that we have to learn to live in two sorts of worlds at once, that we exist both in these, uh, in these micro intimate orders of the family, of firms, our friends, other kinds of institutions, but also in these more anonymous orders of the marketplace and politics and what he calls the great mm -hmm. society. And what, what Hayek argues is, is our moral instincts, our evolved moral instincts, emerged out of life in small groups and in tribes and so on and so our, our sort of now at least in, in developed right. economies. Um, aside, like aside from economics and the economic standpoint of it, how did you uh, work in, and I'm assuming you've worked in, I haven't read your book, it's obviously it's not out, but how did you work in Hayek's conception of knowledge and law into the, into the, the family aspect as well? Well, I think knowledge from, from a couple different perspectives, right? I mean, certainly the idea that uh, people have local and dispersed and uh, tacit con uh, contextual knowledge is important for understanding what any social institution does, right? But if you think in terms of what 
how parents how parents raise kids, right? Certainly, we see that same kind of knowledge at work there. When we think about designing family policies, we face the same kinds of problems that we face with other with economic policy. In in how do policymakers know what the one size fits all solution is that will cover everyone? Whether it's about how parents should interact with their kids or about how married couples should divide up work and home, you know, we were joking before we went on air about boyfriends and girlfriends, right? But those kind of questions, right, are questions every couple does it differently because they each have local knowledge about, about what works and what doesn't, and there's idiosyncratic reasons they do what they do. So once you understand that social institutions are there as processes for people to pursue their own ends, you begin to think in, in, in those kind of Hayekian terms. So simply speaking, that the family is autonomous in and of itself. Instinct, moral instinct is to think in terms of altruism and the people we know and, uh, and and having a common goal for the groups we affiliate with. That's how we tend to see the world from this you know, evolved perspective. But those don't work, right? Those don't work in the world yeah. of the market and the great society. And so we're constantly trying to figure out the difference between the two and how to exist in them. What families do is help us under learn that, right? That within right. the family we can learn those moral rules and how to navigate those two sorts of worlds. And so family becomes a key institution in, in making that happen. Okay, so would I be correct in saying that, <clears throat> that the libertarians looking at the family as a building block of the market structure and how they respond to the market and how capitalism has changed certain societal roles, that per perhaps the conservative put a more moral stance on, 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 on the family? Go I think ahead. that's pretty accurate. Um, you know, one of the things I would say is that, that you know, the families of economic building block in the sense that what families do now, of course, is their consumption. That's where we consume things within the household, to be specific. 300, 400, or thousands of years ago, families were about the production end, right? The family was the same thing as the firm, a farm or, a, or, or you know, having a cottage industry or something like that. So families always had an economic role, but what capitalism did is to switch that from it being a unit of, mostly a unit of production to being primarily a unit of consumption. We work for other people. We don't normally work within the family. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to what I think is episode five of Unbiased America Live. We're here with our regular panel. We got Grant Phillips of uh, We Are Capitalists and the Modern Libertarian, who will also be on the Tom Woods show. You're recording tomorrow. Do you know when that airs, Grant? It records tomorrow at 4:30, and I think it's probably going to air the next day or maybe Saturday. But it'll be this, it'll be soon on the podcast, right? Yeah, on the podcast. All right, great. And we have uh, Kevin Ryan, the purveyor of Unbiased America and Unbiased America's creator and has really great hair. I don't know where that came from. It just seems to be from last week. It's got even better. I don't know how that's possible without modern medicine. Um, <laughs> we also have Matt Palumbo, uh, who's the author of two books. Matt, can you tell us your two books again? I forgot them, but they're cool. Uh, I'm surprised you, you forgot them, but um, it's uh, The Conscience of a Young Conservative and uh, In Defense of Classical Liberalism. I mean, I have a review on the back of your In Defense of Classical Liberalism. Yeah. So I've read it twice. Also, we have our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Steve Horwitz. He's the Charles A. Dana Professor and Chair at the Department of Economics at St. Lawrence University, as well as an affiliate scholar at GMU's Mercatus Center. Um, we're here to discuss, well, one of the things to discuss is your new book, um, Hayek's Modern Family, 